Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Uh, we're going to mix it up. We're not going to talk about meme coins. Maybe. Actually, no. Yeah, we're not going to talk about meme coins. We're going to talk about things, physical things in the physical world. Uh, we're going to talk about mapping technology. I'll run through some slides so everyone kind of has a good sense of kind of what we're building, how it all works, and then we'll dive a little bit into like things that are coming into the future. Uh, and where we're all headed. So HiveMap is actually the fastest growing map project of all time. If you compare this to things like uh, OpenStreetMap, you compare this things to like Waze and so forth, uh, it is now faster than all of those. So we've mapped about, I think we're up to about 28% of the global road network in about two years. Uh, in addition to that, we have real customers utilizing the product. So we're now serving three of the top 10 global uh, map makers, uh, hopefully soon to be four. Um, in addition to all of the contributors that are driving around with our device, we have tens of thousands of what we refer to as AI trainers, right? So these are people who are labeling all of the various models that ultimately get deployed on the device so that we can see and understand the world, right? All the AI models that are executed, executing on the edge. All right, so let's kind of just go through this in terms of how it works. So we're all talking the same language, and we all kind of understand what's going on. So we build and design the devices. That's really, really, really critical so that we have absolute 100% control over it, right? We can build the map on the device. We can just upload those pieces that we want, and that has all of the right sensors to fundamentally build the map that we need in order to serve the customers. Um, the other part about this is that there's a whole kind of AI training platform, right? So there's all these like little games that are played by tens of thousands of users, and they're effectively training the model. So a model would be like, hey, I need you to understand this is a toll, uh, uh, these are toll prices, right? Or this is a truck stop, right? Or this is a specific type of turn restriction sign and so forth. And so they're doing all of that. Once those models are ready to go, they're then ultimately deployed to the device. The drivers, as well as the uh, contributors who are training all of the AI models, earn honey, uh, that it's commensurate with how much value they're actually providing to the map. And you can see and track all of our progress in our Explorer on the map, which is kind of a fun thing to do. OK, so let's talk about the business side of this. right? I think one of the common misconceptions out there is that, OK, maps are used a lot. right? We all use maps. In fact, 2 billion people use Google Maps every single month. Uh, but how do you make money off of it? Well, let me talk a little bit about the money side, right? So even though you don't pay for Google Maps, uh, you are being monetized, right? So the Google Maps product on itself probably makes somewhere between 12 to $15 billion a year. And I would consider that a pretty uh, under-monetized product. There's another aspect of even if you never use Google Maps, you're like, I'm going, I'm, you know, I don't want to do Google Maps anymore, I'm out of here, you are still utilizing Google Maps, right? You go to Uber, you go to Airbnb, you go to Lyft, you go to like a government website, you fill out a form on a bank, whatever it is, you are utilizing Google Maps. The second largest or the third largest uh, ride-sharing company in Asia spends on the or tens of millions of dollars on Google Maps API products, right? Um, so you can imagine that you know businesses like FedEx and UPS and the United States government, they spend a pretty penny on all of those products and services as well. The other big category is commercial fleets. There's roughly 250 million to 300 commercial fleets, right? So this is everybody from a FedEx UPS down to a pest control business that has 300 vehicles running around town and going to various appointments throughout the day. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But that's a very large and actually very lucrative category. The third category, which today is relatively smaller, is all the autonomous vehicles. I'm not just talking about like a Waymo, which is obviously full robo-taxi. I'm talking about things that are like level two and above. So this would be like a Ford Blue Cruise. Uh, GM has their version of it and so forth. And they're actually monetizing those products. And integrated into all of those products are maps and a lot of the data that actually we provide. OK. Um, the Fundamentally, I would argue that there has not been any serious amount of innovation in the mapping world since like roughly ways in 2012. So let's go back even before that. The first major innovation in digital mapping it was effectively satellite, digital satellite imagery, which came about in the early 2000s. 
Then you had Google Street View, which was like 2006, okay? Each of those vehicles that you see driving around cost them all in somewhere in the range of $300,000 to $500,000, right? We're talking about the sensor package, we're talking about the car itself, the gas, the insurance, like every, you know, the driver, paying the driver, et cetera. That's a very expensive asset. And so um, th then you ultimately had ways in terms of motion, I'll get to talking about that. But those were like the three major innovations in the mapping world, and we really haven't seen anything new since 2012. Um, each of these Google Street View cars, they only see a given location, like in New York City, which they're probably as, as relatively high frequency, is probably once every 12 months, right? You go to suburban Chicago or suburban Austin, Texas, it's probably more like two to three years. Um, if you go outside the country, like a Romania, if they have it, maybe every eight to 10 years. So it is very, very, very low cadence. What does that mean? Is that Google fundamentally is not seeing very much of the road network on a given week, on a given month. So what, what they do have in real time is motion, right? You are all sitting with your iPhone or Android device, and that is emitting or collecting GPS data, right? So they can say, okay, this road over here where most people usually travel 40 miles an hour, now they're traveling 10 miles an hour because they're f basically tracking your GPS traces. But and it is really, really, really hard to build and update a map with that kind of data because you can't see and you can't understand what's actually happening um, in the actual physical world. So, you know, we have this internal saying, which is like, if you can't see it, you can't map it, right? So, yeah, sure, I could, if I had GPS traces, I could surmise very quickly that, yeah, there's some slowdown here. But what is the source of that slowdown, right? Was there an accident, right? Was there flooding on the road? Is there a tree that is blocked down and is slowing down traffic? Or is it construction? All of those have very, very, very different impacts, not just in terms of like the traffic patterns for like this very second, but 30 minutes from now, 90 minutes from now, and so forth. You know, we, we, we looked at this, and this is actually fun, you know, something we do internally a lot, which is we look at like how are we, you know, what do we see relative to like what Google's not saying, right? So here you see like basically an entirely new neighborhood goes up, and Google hadn't seen that neighborhood, and I actually just checked this last night, they still don't have it, right? So this is a good example, and, and, and there's like endless amounts of scenarios just like this, right? Um, and so the real kind of aha, just kind of going back to that one, is, oops, all right, I will get back to that point in a second. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about our cost advantage, right? So the device that we build, um, that we design and build and sell costs somewhere in the range of 450 bucks to 550 bucks, depending upon whether or not we're running a sale that given week. Um, if you compare that to a Google Street View car, that's roughly $500,000, so you do the math, we can put about a million of these devices into the roads for you know, 1,000 of theirs, right? So just a massive, massive cost advantage. Um, the other cost advantages, especially with our new device called the B, we can actually build the map on the edge, right? So if you're collecting all this imagery and then you need to upload all this imagery and process it on AWS, that is a very, very fast way to bankrupt the company. Um, and while it'll make our AWS sales reps very happy, it will definitely not make our investors happy. And so, you know, a big focus of ours has been basically transferring all of the compute, all of the map AI, to the actual device, which is what we do in our upcoming device. All right, so there are really two parts of what this device does. So one is vision. So what, what does that mean? That basically means is it can see a sign, it can see a speed limit sign, a turn restriction sign, a traffic light, and it can properly detect the thing, okay, there's a turn restriction sign and it's time restricted between four and 6 p.m. and you can't make a left-hand turn there. And it can properly position that. That's all really hard and that's very valuable, but at this point, we've gotten really good at that. There's another aspect, which I think is even more interesting, is basically what we refer to as spatial intelligence. And what that really means is, I'll give you a quick example and explain the concept. So yes, we can detect that there's a truck way station over here on the side of Highway 80 as you're going through Reno. Interesting, okay, but what do I really wanna know? 
I really want to know whether or not that truck way station is currently open and how many trucks are currently in line, right? So now I actually have intelligence about that truck stop, which I'm like, look, if you're a trucker and you're trying to get from San Francisco to Denver and you're going through 80, you're gonna be behind 35 trucks in that way station, right? And so that's the kind of intelligence that we can start to bring. We can start to read toll prices, right? And we can start to say, okay, this section of the road has toll prices because they're dynamic and constantly fluctuating based upon traffic and other things, which is, you know, 30 bucks versus this other road has none. Or like, hey, you can get off the road over here and then come back and save yourself 30 or 40 bucks, right? That actually makes a big difference. And it makes a big difference to many of those commercial truckers and commercial fleets that are some of our customers. Okay, so you ask yourself, hey, Ariel, this is pretty cool, but you're kind of counting on a lot of people buying your device, right, installing your device, whether it be a commercial fleet or, you know, a crypto nerd or a crypto degen or whoever it may be, but there's a lot of cars in the road. How do you ultimately get like a shit, sorry, a, a ton of density? And so there the conversations have started with the car OEMs. They, some of them, not all of them, actually have the core sensors that you see in the B already resident on their vehicles. But what they don't have is all of the software, right, all of the Map AI software, combined with all the AI trainer platform that trains the models, that edits the map data, that does QA on the map data. That's tens of thousands of people. And so the conversations have started with these car OEMs to start integrating our mapping technology onto their vehicles, so that they ultimately, their vehicles can become contributors into the wider network and also consume data as well, right? So some of them will maybe consume more than they use, other of those maybe will um, uh, contribute more than they consume, and each car manufacturer will be a little bit different. Okay, let's talk a little bit about our products. We have three major product lines. Let's just say right now there's two major product lines. So there's map data solutions, where we're working with mobility companies, whether it be like a Lyft or an Uber, working with um, other mapping companies like a here, automotive companies like Volkswagen and so forth. And they're integrating various map data products that we provide, right? So whether it be like, hey, we know all about the speed limit signs, turn restriction signs, all that type of stuff, right? There, the, the bar is quite high, right? Like if you're gonna be integrating our data into your existing product, um, you got to make sure we're really, 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 really good, right? The bar there is, is pretty significant. And so those are, you know, definitely really important conversations and really important deals as they continue to grow. There's another, which is what we refer to as Beekeeper. And so Beekeeper, we're selling into the fleets, right? So a traveling nurses company with 300 vehicles, uh, a pest control business with, you know, 200 vehicles in the Philadelphia area, there's about, like I was saying before, about 250 million of those vehicles all over the world. And so we're basically providing them, the, A, the device, right? But B, more importantly, all of the routing intelligence and the road intelligence. So, okay, you know, if you're gonna go this direction, you're gonna have a problem because there's road construction over here. You know, if you wanna like gas up your fleet, this is the best price, right? The toll prices over here are really expensive, so route around here. So all of that road intelligence is, is a product that's directly integrated into Beekeeper, and the uptake on this has been way beyond what we expected, quite frankly. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kinda shift gears here and talk a little bit more about the crypto community, DPIN, uh, decentralized physical infrastructure, and kind of wh where we stand relative to things that came before us, right? If you were an entrepreneur in like, I don't know, 2012, 2013, whenever there were zero interest rates, it was pretty easy to raise capital, right? Um, and you could go out and raise for a lot of these things you see over here, like the Ubers, Airbnbs, DoorDashes, Lyfts, that are, because they exist in the physical world, are, are quite frankly really tough to scale, right? Now they're generating massive amounts of cash, but back then, what was everybody saying, right? Everybody's saying these are cash pits, you know, they're raising a, a ridiculous amounts of money. And so doing that in this era, where interest rates are not zero, is really challenging. But because we're effectively saying, look, it's not just about like us. If we would have to build the device, right, get the cars, pay for the device, all the devices ourselves, 
right? Get all these commercial fleets out there, outfitted with it, and it's all on, you know, all the capital that we had to go up raise. That would be very, very, very challenging. So Deepin does actually drive kind of this new capital formation of physical technology in the physical world. And I think we're only at the very, very, very early stages of that. Obviously, you know, Helium kind of created the category. These things will ultimately grow to be massive, but they will not, just be really clear, they will not happen overnight. Uh, but once you get them installed, they're crazy sticky, right? Like we've seen this now with our existing devices. Nobody, you know, they don't just churn. These users, like, they got the device, they got everything kind of hooked up, and they're there and they're with you for a long period of time, and the demand side as well. Um, this is probably one of the more exciting slides that I've ever put up here. Um, and I think this really speaks, obviously, to the regime change that we've had. Historically, when we were going out and talking about HiveMapper and we were talking about Honey, we were limited, you know, I think quite rightfully, in terms of how we could describe the product, right? How we could describe the broader ecosystem of what we're trying to provide. And so I think with this regime change, this gives us an opportunity to just more clearly talk about the Honey ecosystem, right, that we're trying to build around mapping. There will be many, many different products that people create around this data, around this map. So that I'm just gonna highlight a couple here, right? Obviously, we all talked about the map contributors, you're familiar with that. But there's also developers, right? So developers now saying, okay, I'm gonna build a product that sits on top of this data, or I'm gonna build a kind of a new branch, right? I'm focused on places, right? I wanna build the traffic layer to this map. Those are new branches that can continue to be built on top of this core technology, all, and we're all financially aligned in terms of Honey, right? Even the vehicle OEMs now, we can go and have a series of conversations with the likes of a BMW or a GM and talk about this component much more crisply. And I think that's gonna be really, really important in terms of not just hive mappers growth, but the growth of the entire Honey ecosystem. So thank you very much. Hopefully you guys enjoy your break.